Uh, for those of you who I have not met yet, I'm John Stuart Gordon. I am the Associate Curator of American Decorative Arts here at the Art Gallery. Um, if you would like a keepsake ver picture of Garvin, um, this was the cover image for the talk. I couldn't get the painting out of storage uh, in time to have it brought downtown, but um, I'll just pass these around. And some people just like to have an image of the person that you were talking about. And we're going to be talking about Francis Garvin today and the extraordinary collection. Sorry, what? This one man's collection. Yes, I'll get to that. So, um, it's, um, so but some people just want to know um, who we're talking about. So, what we're talking about today is a man named Francis P. Garvin. And you're sitting amid the Garvin collection, the Mabel Brady Garvin collection, which is one of the kind of the crown jewels of the art gallery. Uh, the Garvin collection in total is about 10,000 objects, um, all made in America or for the American market. It's silver, it's glass, it's ceramics, textiles, prints, paintings, you name it, Garvin collected it. And he gave it to the university in the 1930s. And he named it in honor of his wife, Mabel Brady Garvin. And often when we do these, these talks in the gallery, gallery, we talk about one object or a group of objects. Today, I want to think about the entire collection as an object. And I want to talk about the man behind this collection because um, he was a rather extraordinary character and there's a lot of resonance between his private life and his public life. What he did for work, the collection he built at home, and how it ended up at Yale. So that's kind of what we're going to look at today. Um, and so because we're talking broadly, I just, I put myself in a corner where there are lots of pretty things to look at. So kind of look at whatever you want as I'm talking and I might point our attention to a few specific things. So first, just the story of who is Francis Garvin. He was born in East Hartford. Um, his, he was born to an Irish Catholic family. His father was first generation and made a fair amount of money in, um, in the paper industry. He even served as a state senator for a short while. So this is someone who is a very kind of Horatio Alger, classic American story of someone who comes to the country and does well. Garvin sends his children off to school and Francis Garvin comes to Yale. He graduates Yale in 1897 and immediately he does what every Yale graduate has done ever since, he moves to New York. And he moves to New York and goes to law school and he gets his law degree in 1899. And here he is, this young lawyer living in New York and um, he's you know, from a good Connecticut family. He went to an Ivy League university, but very suddenly everything in his life changes. He gets put on, um, he's working as an assistant district attorney in New York and he gets put on a case in 1906. And it was the case of the century at that time. It was a murder trial. Um, m some of you have probably heard of the architect uh, Stanford White. So White was having an affair with a woman named Evelyn Nesbitt, and the man's um, and the woman's husband um, confronts White and shoots him dead. Young Garvin is the opening prosecutor in the Sanford White murder trial. And this was the crime of the century. It was on every front page of the newspapers. And here, this young lawyer is suddenly in gossip columns. He's in uh, the society pages. And a lot of focus has been put on him. And right around this time, he is living in New York. Um, his roommate is a young man named um, Anthony Brady. And he introduces him to his sister, and they get married. And in return, Brady introduces Garvin to his sister, Mabel. 
And in 1910, they get married. So very kind of close-knit community where you know, the brothers and sisters both, like, both, um, both married. And this was a greatly advantageous marriage for Garvin. Mabel Brady was beautiful, she was well-connected, and she was from an incredibly wealthy family. Her family was also Irish Catholic, so they shared uh, a kind of a common cultural background. But the Brady family had uh, settled in Troy, New York, and then had moved to Albany. Mabel's father was um, involved in utilities, and he lay all of the util utility lines for the streetcars in the state of New York, and kind of had developed kind of a corner on the utilities trade in New York. And so, very prosperous uh, family. And young Francis and Mabel um, start their life off together. Uh, Francis was a bit of a collector. He uh, collected books primarily. Um, he was a member of the Grolier Club and the Meeting House Club and these gentlemen cl clubs in New York that were mostly about collecting books. But together they start um, buying objects to fill their home. And what they buy is mostly British furniture and British silver, the kind of things that well-to-do couples in the 19-teens were, were buying. Then everything changes again. Um, in 1913, Mabel's father dies. And he leaves his estate evenly divided between his widow and his children. The estate was valued at $77 million. Now today that won't buy you a Picasso, but back in 1913, that was a lot of money. And just to put it in perspective, uh, J. Pierpont Morgan also died in 1913, and his estate was valued at $78 million. So we are talking about wealth equal to J. Pierpont Morgan. And so, you could, so their life changed. Um, they were able to suddenly do things on a much more ambitious and grand scale. And it's around this time that Garvin really sets in motion this idea of becoming a collector. By 1916, he's abandoned British material and is focused on American. He's developing a network of dealers and scholars to use as resources. And about 1916, he becomes friends with a man named Francis Hill Bigelow, who was a scholar and collector living in Boston. And Bigelow wrote some early texts on Massachusetts silver. He did exhibitions at the MFA Boston. He, um, he was very instrumental in kind of creating the knowledge base around uh, colonial Massachusetts Bay Colony silver. And the correspondence between Garvin and Bigelow starts off very polite. Uh, it's very kind of um, paternal almost. For, uh, Bigelow is teaching Garvin how to look at silver and saying, these are the elements of connoisseurship. This is what you should look for in a good piece of silver. V subtly, it changes. And then he, Bigelow starts mentioning Oh, and by the way, I know where a cream pot is that maybe we could um, acquire for you. And, oh, I know where a teapot is that I really think should be in your collection. So it, the relationship changed from just giving advice to Bigelow kind of becoming um, his feeder or his picker for objects. And this was fairly controversial because Bigelow was a scholar. He was not a dealer. And the letters are filled with references to, you cannot tell anyone that you got this object from me. <laughs> and Garvin wanted to know the provenance. He wanted to know the family history. He um, was really worried about buying fakes. And he felt that if you knew the family provenance, if you knew the history of an object, that was a safeguard against buying a forgery. But Bigelow wouldn't tell him. Even in one letter he says, okay, I'll write a list of where I found everything and I'll give it to you after I die. <laughs> you know, he was so concerned um, that it would get out in Boston society that he was um, helping a collector build his collection. And this was a real fear. Um, and, I, and I show you this, I'm standing next to this um, silver service as kind of an example of this. This is the complete 
communion service from the church in Ipswich, Massachusetts. This is the kind of grouping of silver that Bigelow was actively trying to save. He was talking to churches, trying to get them to donate their silver to the Museum of Fine Arts Boston or other institutions. He was trying to keep these objects, these groups of objects whole. And we don't have a letter that talks about Bigelow get, giving Garvin access to this, but you know, this, Bigelow is consulting Garvin on acquisitions like this. So you could understand how tense it would be in the rather small social world of Boston if people knew that um, Bigelow was helping things like the Ipswich Church Silver leave Massachusetts. And it also would have been doubly scandalous because not only would it be leaving Massachusetts, it would be being sold to an Irish Catholic who lived in New York. And Bigelow was very conscious of what kind of potential feathers would get ruffled. The other major collector of this type of material, a man named Alfonso Clearwater, also lived in New York, was from Dutch extraction, and Bigelow was just as worried about people knowing that um, things might end up in the Clearwater collection also. So this is idea of saving the past was very, um, was very potent, but um, the idea that we had to save the past for the right people. In the, uh, in the conversations with, with Bigelow, Garvin repeatedly says, I want objects that tell their own story. And as we talk, um, by the time we get to the end of this talk, I hope you get a sense of how Garvin was thinking about this collection as a whole and the kind of stories it would tell. And the fact that he's thinking about objects that tell their own story, I think is quite important. Remember, he is an attorney. He is based at looking at facts and judging facts and then trying to create an argument. And he once said that when looking at a piece of furniture, he treats it as if it was on trial for murder. And he looks at all the different elements to see if anything is wrong and if it's guilty of anything. You know, he kind of put his collection through the same kind of intellectual rigor as he did um, his own trials. And similarly, he liked objects that had evidence on them. And so if you look around the Garvin collection, there are a lot of pieces that have engraving, that have inscriptions, or we know uh, that they could be labeled, or we know who they were originally made for. And those were the kinds of um, things that Garvin really loved, um, because that meant the object was telling its own story. So as an example of this, I brought out of storage uh, one of my favorite uh, pieces of silver. This is, when I teach um, undergraduate silver classes, this is the first object I make students look at. Um, and I'm gonna make you look at it also. And, and some of you have already been able to see it, but this is a great example of an object telling its own story. We've been talking about Boston and Boston silver. This is New York. This is probably from about 1690. It was made by a man named Bartholomew LaRue, who was one of the leading silversmiths working in Boston in the late 17th century. He's a Huguenot, so this has a very kind of, um, he's a Huguenot by way of um, Amsterdam, so this has a very Dutch, um, Dutch feel to it. So why would, so what do you notice about this bowl? And some of you picked up on this already, so feel free to. Inscription inside the carving. The carving, so you, the inscription on the inside and the outside, and then, and is that what you were thinking about? I can't really yeah. read it, but I see inscriptions. Yeah, so it's, it might be hard to read, but this thing is covered with inscriptions oh. all the way around it even on the inside. The one side that does not have an inscription is the underside. But, so you know that these inscriptions were meant to be seen. They weren't meant to be hidden. Do you think these inscriptions are the same age as the bowl? No. Uh -huh. No, you immediately shook your head. Why not? It was probably done as a gift. It was probably done as a gift. If you look closely, and hopefully some of you will be able to look closely at this um, later, it's normally in a case in our silver hall, so I had to bring it out so you could really get close to it. 
It's all different kinds of handwriting. Mm -hmm. And the only old inscription is a set of initials on this side, which is the initials of the original owners. And then every generation, as it passed down, added their own names. What you're looking at is a family register. Family. It's a family, and this, this is the kind. Of, it's a brandywine bowl, and it's a tradition that in Dutch households, um, for celebratory occasions like a wedding or the birth of a child, you would serve brandy with um, cherries or other, some kind of fruit in there, soaking up the liquor, and you would spoon it out and um, make for a very festive evening. And so this is linked to marriage and birth and it passed down through the female line of this family. And their names, the date of acquisition, and where they lived is here. So you can trace the family as they started in New Jersey and, and finally ended up in Boston, where it was when uh, Mr. Garvin acquired it. So purists um, think that this bowl has been compromised because it has so much later writing on it. You know, a, a purist would want it to be completely untouched as it looked in 1690. Garvin was probably drawn to the fact that its history is written on it. And you know that this bowl is right because we know who all these people are and there are stories there. And you can trace this object back through time, back um, to its original owners, and you know that it was valued and cared for um, for all of those, those subsequent hundreds Years. Is there a difference in the handwriting since they're all different people? Exactly, there is difference in the handwriting. And um, you know, it's, I think there's two campaigns of handwriting. So the family history was probably applied mostly probably in the late 19th century around the colonial revival period when families were trying to project their link to the colonial past. And then they kept up they kept it up into the 20th century. So. Is the last one, which is the latest writing on that? Um, I'm looking at 1904, but the last family is, um, it's 1922. So it goes right up to when Garvin acquires it. Why so. is Well, this is the why, um, you asked why they sold it. That's kind of one of those polite questions that, like, that was the whole problem with uh, Francis Hill Bigelow saying, like, I can't tell you who's selling these things. It's probably um, a bit scandalous why you have to sell something. I mean, this could not have been something easy to part with. The family probably didn't want people to know they had to sell it. Yeah. In the auction world, they say it's the three Ds that drive sales, death, divorce, and debt. You know, it's never kind of a happy reason why you have to part with an object. So we don't know the full story of why they parted with it, but you know, that idea that these, these interactions, uh, these exchanges had to be kind of kept quiet and kind of kept polite. So we've talked about Garvin. We've talked about, um, we've talked about Bigelow. We've talked about kind of how the collection was formed. I was going to move to another room, but I think actually we're really happily settled right here. Um, we might take up the rest of our time moving, so we won't move. Um, I wanted to spend the rest of the time talking about the background for this collection. So I mentioned Garvin is you know, starting these dialogues in 1916. He's collecting into, the, into 1920. Maybe this is ringing a bell for something that's going on in the world right around this time period. And so Garvin is maturing as a collector right as the world is going to war. And when the United States enters World War I in 1917, Garvin immediately um, gives himself into the war effort. He goes to Washington and starts working for a newly, um, a newly established office that was created by President Wilson um, as part of some of the not so friendly um, War, um, war offices and war laws that came around right in 1917. So Garvin goes to work for the Office of Alien Property Custodian, the most uncatchy name for an office ever. Say that again. The Office of the Alien Property Custodian. Thank you. It's a very polite way of saying this is the office that took um, 
they confiscated all enemy-owned property um, of foreign nationals from enemy countries who were living in the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is part of this um, wartime atmosphere that was, hap that was happening in the 1917, 18 range. You know, this is the period where you have you know, the Espionage Act of 1917, the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, the Sedition Act of 1918. There, um, there's so many laws that are getting passed trying to kind of safeguard America from, this, from our enemy. And Garvin is right there doing um, what was perceived as his patriotic duty, um, giving his energy and his efforts to the war. Once the uh, armistice is called in 1918, um, Garvin stays on in Washington, and he helps found something called the Chemical Foundation. And this was a semi-public-private organization that um, oversaw all of the, the chemical patents that had been confiscated during the war. And it administrated those patents and um, kind of gave them out to companies like DuPont. And du in this story of American decorative arts, DuPont is one of the other great family names as they're also collecting. So these, these families are kind of overlapped in rather fascinating ways. And I think this is important to remember. I mean, in the 1920s, Garvin was a public figure and a rather well-known public figure. There, he was um, routinely in the newspaper. There was a great political cartoon of Garvin as David and um, the German chemical corporations as Goliath. And here is Garvin slaying Goliath for the, for, um, the betterment of the United States. And they were talked about things like they wanted to have chemical independence from Europe. So people saw this, these acts as really patriotic. We have a problem with them today. Um, we recognize them as xenophobic and, um, and often quite unfair. But we need to remember that in this period, this was seen as um, great acts of, of patriotism. And it's against this background that Garvin is acquiring Americana. And I think that's quite fascinating to think about. Here is someone whose public life was dedicated to safeguarding American manufacturing, and American business, and really kind of promoting the idea of America. And in his private life, he is expending all his resources to build up a collection that celebrates American craftsmanship, American ingenuity, and the American story. And so that idea that he likes objects that tell stories, um, yeah, it's very similar to what he did during the day. You know, he loves things by Paul Revere, the great patriot silversmith. You know, he loves things uh, associated with great merchants. You know, so it's an interesting way of thinking about this collection as a product of that post-World War I culture um, that was really kind of seeing America as something that needed to be preserved and celebrated. And this, um, this informs what Garvin does with the collection. He had lent it out to historic houses and museums. Um, he, Gracie Mansion in New York was furnished with pieces from his collection. The Philadelphia Museum had pieces from his collection. Martha Washington's house in, um, the Martha Washington house in Fredericksburg, Virginia had Garvin pieces. Like, they were everywhere up and down the eastern seaboard because he wanted he didn't want to hoard the objects. He wanted to have them be seen and to have the stories be known. And he also put some objects on loan with Yale in the mid-1920s. He decided to make the gift to the gallery in 1930. And a, a scholar has put together a really fascinating timeline of this gift and discovered that there was a slight ulterior motive for the gift to, to Yale. We're pretty sure that Garvin always meant for the collection to come here, because he says that a few places, but he probably didn't mean for it to come so soon. He was an incredibly generous alum, um, and he r repeatedly made gifts and made pledges to the university. So 1929, um, some Something happened, <laughs> and um, 
in the financial crash of 1929, the Garvins lost a lot of money. So did Yale. So did everyone. And Yale came knocking, asking for payment of its pledges, because it needed, it needed the money. And Garvin couldn't pay. So in lieu of cash, he gave the collection. So, as I said, this probably happened sooner than he wanted. But he, al he had an idea for what this collection should be at Yale. So in 1930, he formally creates the Mabel Brady Garvin Institute for American Arts and Crafts. So that is the official title of this collection, and it was to be stewarded by the art gallery. But it was meant to be its own freestanding entity. And it was, it was supposed to do eight things. And sorry, I'm going to tell you all eight. Um, you don't have to pay attention to all of them, but some of them are good. Um, it needed to supervise all those loans that were in historic houses. And actually, to this day, we still have objects at Mount Vernon and Monticello and at other historic sites across the country. So we've, we still do that. Um, it was to purchase objects to add to the collection um, and to continually refine and upgrade the collection. So it was never meant to be a static thing. It was always meant to be dynamic and to grow and better itself. Would it also include getting rid of pieces? Um, yes, as part of the refinement process. Yeah. But, you know, we we're very selective about that. Um, and then, you know, it had to support the restoration and conservation of the Garvin collection. It had to do traveling exhibitions drawn from the collection. It had to publish the collection. And then it had to support lectures and articles on the collection. And this is one of my favorite little codicils of this gift. Um, and it shows how savvy Garvin was. Because he writes, with television perfected, now he, remember he's writing in 1930, with television perfected, as undoubtedly it will be in the near future as radio is now, we shall be able to carry the benefits of these collections to the very fireside. So he is picturing using new technology to bring knowledge of the collections and their stories out into every household. And this is 1930. This is before FDR's fireside chats. But he's using that same verbiage of bringing his collection into the hearth. And had he foreseen the internet, had he foreseen YouTube, had he for, uh, foreseen um, portable video machines, he would be really happy with what we're doing today um, of disseminating ideas about this collection. And then um, he wanted to be able to teach the connoisseurship in order to detect forgeries. And again, this shows how kind of shrewd and ahead of his time he was thinking about this collection. Because he writes, again, quote, measurements by the physics department, tests by the chemistry department, and methods of, its, of study employed by the determination of forged handwriting will help judge if works are authentic. It has taken a while, but Yale has finally created um, their Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, which is kind of an umbrella organization of um, scientists and researchers from across the university to do just this. And we are finally able to actually draw on the chemistry department and the physics department, other departments <laughs> at Yale, to apply scientific testing to this collection. But this is something he's already thinking about in 1930, which is really quite amazing. And then his last, um, his last request is that the collection, quote, well, to be able in the future to provide for the accurate and proper reproduction of these objects as trophies for contention by the youth of America. And also to be used to, uh, for sale and marketing. Now, anyone who was a Yale undergraduate or is in this, the sphere may have known of the Ting Cup, which is the Yale intramural sports trophy. It's based on a two-handled cup that is one gallery over and was copied in the 1930s and turned into the undergraduate sports trophy. So, Yes, we did that also. Um, but I love the fact that like, all of these rather wonderful um, and kind of visionary ideas 
we're actually put into, um, we're put into motion. And um, we were able to kind of create this vision. And Garvin was very, um, he knew what he was doing when he put this as a, at an educational institution. Again, think, think of his work during the day um, for promoting American industry and disseminating an idea of America as culturally and financially and chemically independent from Europe. He wanted that idea to also echo in the university setting. And he writes at a different point, all art museums should be allied with the university. That the passerby walking through a museum observes very little, but our young studying in the university with the chance to study and understand, they are the hope for art in our country. So he wanted the, these objects to be used as to tell stories and to get people in a university and museum setting to like, engage with the past and think about um, these objects as, as objects that express themselves and objects that kind of teach a story. So that's kind of my introduction to Francis and Mabel Brady Garvin and to kind of the backstory behind how this collection has formed. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Yes. I have a question about the new acquisitions. Yes. Okay. When you um, buy them, are they included in your umbrella of the, this collection, the Garvin collection, or are they separate? It's complicated. The question was um, new acquisitions. Do they fit into the uh, umbrella of the Garvin collection? Garvin's collecting spanned almost every department in this museum currently. Um, he collected sporting art and prints and drawings. So uh, when we collect now, we don't really collect for the Garvin collection. Um, but we always tr want to complement our existing holdings. And if you're collecting something that's American, 10 to 1, its, it's neighbors are going to be a Garvin object. Mm -hmm. So we think about how um, a new acquisition will fit in with the collection we have. And like in terms of American silver, we have the greatest collection in the country. And Garvin, that was his true passion. There are very few things we need. But he wasn't able to collect everything. So every once in a while, we'll find something that fills a gap. Same thing with the furniture, same thing with paintings. You know, so we're always trying to fill gaps and enrich that story. Yes, so, please. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but when the person passed away who was his secret provider, did he list the provenance of everything? So the question is, Francis Hill Bigelow's mysterious list of his sources that he would give to Garvin after his death. I knew someone would ask that. We don't have it. But we have Bigelow's papers. Uh, he, the papers ended up at Yale. And so we're able to construct um, a fair amount of provenance information just because we have his, his archive. I think that, that promised him, right, it was probably a way of kind of putting him, putting him off. off and saying, oh, stop, quest, like, after I die, you'll find out. You know, and, and it's, <laughs> Can you tell us yes. more about the deacquisition? Has the, has the art gallery sold any of these items? Um, the question is about deacquisition, everyone's favorite topic. Um, we are incredibly conservative about um, deacquisitions. And um, we will get rid of something if it's redundant, if it is proved to be a fake, uh, or something that's not um, valuable for the teaching mission. And because we teach here, sometimes a fake is a great thing to have. You know, you can teach a student or a group like this the difference between you know, modern woodworking techniques and 17th century woodworking techniques. So it gets very difficult to try to um, de-access things. Because we also don't know how scholarship changes. Mm -hmm. Something that I don't like today. In 30 years, the future me may think, oh, wow. We now understand that object, and oh, I wish we had held on to it. You know, so we're, we try to be very, very conservative. So I will say, um, kind of in closing, that a lot of 
my thinking about this material was inspired by um, a woman named um, Catherine Whalen, who is uh, working on a book manuscript on the life of Garvin and his collecting. And um, her research, um, she found a lot of these stories in the archives. And um, her way of thinking about Garvin very broadly and thinking about how these objects fit into the colonial revival story uh, really made me see this collection in a different way. So probably about in a year or two, look for a book on Francis Garvin in your local bookstore and buy it and learn the full story of Francis and Mabel Brady Garvin and their extraordinary collection. Thank you. Thank you.